Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to today's Live Inspired podcast episode. So glad that you're here with me today, and I'd love to stay connected with you all week long. Could you use a little inspiration beyond just this podcast? If you could, I hope you can, connect with me. I'm very active on social media, sharing positive, actionable thoughts and videos and posts about what could be inspiring to you right this moment. So find me on Facebook by searching John O'Leary Live Inspired. My Instagram handle is johnoleary.inspires. Or if you're hanging out on Twitter, the handle there is at J-O-Leary Inspires. Anywhere that you are on social media, we are hanging out as well. And we are sharing news that is elevating for you in your work, in your relationships, and in your life. I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. You know, one of the great gifts of doing the work that I do professionally as a speaker is that I have the opportunity of meeting amazing individuals as I'm traveling around the world. Sometimes they appear while I'm seated in the back of a cab. Uh, I find some of their stories are just stunning and remarkable and humbling. Sometimes they're individuals that I meet, uh, baristas at coffee shops or individuals in the back of a speaking audience. They can be amazing in the stories that they also share. And then occasionally, It's the speakers that I get to listen to when I'm getting ready to do my own work. It's the ladies and gentlemen who dance across the stage and share their heart. They share their mind. They share their lessons. And that's the story that I want to share with you today. The name of the guest today is Rand Stegan. And after I heard him speak in Dallas at a conference just a couple months back, I walked over to him, gave him a hug. And the very first thing I said was, Rand, that was awesome. And I know I'm going to have you on the podcast. Just get ready for it, man. Buckle up because it's on. So today, my friends, I'm going to invite you to buckle up because it is on. We get to introduce you to Rand Stegan. He's my friend. He's the managing director of Stegan Leadership Academy. Prior to founding that, Rand was president of Presido Media Group. He's a publisher of newspapers and magazines in the Southwest. He's a chapter president of YEO, past chairman of Conscious Capitalism. He lives in Dallas. He's got two daughters. He's an amazing guy. He's with us on the Live Inspired Podcast. So do me a big favor. Open wide your minds. Slow down. Breathe. Open up your hearts. Get ready to take some notes today because I get to introduce you to a guy that I respect. His name, Rand Stig. And Rand, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. All right. Well, thanks for the introduction, John, and the warm welcome. It's great to be with you and all those listening. Well, uh, in most of the seminars that I am part of, we talk about getting more done. We talk about sales. We talk about motivation or execution or engagement. And then along comes Rand Stegen, who sits on stage and helps us slow down so that we can do more effective work going forward. Uh, I I loved the process you guided us through. We're going to be talking a lot about conscious capitalism, a lot about meditation, a lot about recalibrating, a lot about leadership. And yet, before we talk about that stuff, Rand, give us a snapshot of the work that you're doing today. Sure. So, broadly speaking, uh, as you mentioned, I'm a uh, I'm a partner in a leadership academy, a brick and mortar school, we could call it here in Dallas, Texas, and we work with leaders from a variety of different backgrounds from all over the United States and a little bit in Canada, who uh, who come to Dallas to train with our faculty. You mentioned conscious capitalism, and so one way to think about what we do is uh, part of our work is on the consciousness side, the the soft side of leadership, so it could be around finding a sense of meaning or purpose, it could be around influence, it could be around uh, connecting and, uh, and moving oneself and moving others towards, uh, towards meaningful goals. And on the other side of our work is the capitalism piece. And so what we've been, uh, what we've been attempting to do is integrate for the last 20 years in our work is integrate the best of that soft side of leadership 
and sometimes would be called the sort of idealistic side of leadership with the more pragmatic side of leadership on taking concepts and putting them on the ground uh, and uh, and really, as you said, making uh, making things effective. And so, uh, so broadly speaking, I I hope that I can speak to uh, <clears throat> anyone listening that there are there are really two domains of anyone's life, whether they're leading a family or leading a, a business as a CEO, and it's that uh, that intangible side and the tangible side. So the, broadly, uh, that's uh, that's what we're up to in Dallas. Well, I spoke just yesterday with a group called Undivided, and uh, they help people with wealth management, but they're really about focusing on knocking down the walls that separate us from the conscious and unconscious and work and life and relationships and spiritual journey and physical life and yeah. how all of this stuff plays together as one. When I sat through your session, that's what I experienced. I, uh, I felt lighter and uh, better after we experienced what we walked through together. I want to share that experience with our listeners today. But before we get there, Rand, you live in Dallas, but it's not where you grew up. You grew up on the East Coast. Take us back to Connecticut. I- I did. I grew up in uh, in Greenwich, Connecticut, uh, about 45 minutes outside of New York City. Uh, one sister, three years older, and uh, and my mom, uh, who I was raised by. My dad lived in Seattle. Uh, parents uh, were divorced when I was young, and so uh, so was basically there through high school, and then uh, wanted to do one thing, uh, graduating on the East Coast from high school, which is I wanted to get to a warmer climate, and so I found myself going to Southern Methodist University, SMU in Dallas, and uh, and I have been here since 1989. So you scooted forward pretty quickly along the journey. As you look back at those formative years, share one really profound leader who stepped into your life and, and shaped who you became as a, as a young man and now as a, as a more seasoned veteran of leadership. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 it's a great question uh, to think about what experiences we had being shaped uh, early on, and I, I would imagine that with many of your guests, uh, so many, uh, so many of the times, you know, family members were uh, were part of that kind of early mentoring. And I had uh, my my grandfather on my maternal side. My mom's father uh, was someone who had a a pretty significant. Uh, impact on who uh, who I have become, and uh, I would say that uh, that 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 that's the top of my list is uh, is my maternal grandfather. Just talk about your grandfather for a moment. I I think that when you go deeper into relationships with individuals, for me, one of the things that is always most attractive about them is to learn about the people who influence them, and it, almost like a tree, you see like the little rings of their influence within them. And so I'm I'm curious about your mother's father. What, what was it about him that really uh, shaped the guy that I'm talking to today? Yeah, it's a uh, it, it's it's fascinating. As I'm, I'm smiling, listening to the question as you sort of double click in, uh, because so much of what what has shaped me came from from the kind of home he built. So he uh, he. He grew his uh, his business. He was also an entrepreneur. He was a mechanic and owned a uh, an automobile an automobile shop and a, and a gas station in uh, in uh, in California, right um, uh, right near San Jose in Cup- what's called Cupertino, and where my mother grew up and um, and uh, and ultimately moved herself to the East Coast, where I uh, was raised. But when I think about the sort of origin, it's that my grandfather. Uh, created an environment, a very loving and a very progressive environment for his family. Uh, my grandmother, obviously, being a part of that, and then my mother and her sister. And I, I would have to say, John, that the um, that the that the environment that I would visit every summer for about I'd spend about six to eight weeks with my grandparents every summer, literally my entire childhood, um, all the way uh, all the way up to high school. And what I would, um, what I really would appreciate, in retrospect, looking back on it, is just the um, the progressiveness. And since you uh, and I first met when I was doing a mindfulness workshop at uh, at the conference we were at together, one of the things that, that that I haven't thought about in many years is that the first time uh, I have a memory of someone meditating, hmm. it was uh, it was actually. Uh, uh, in the 70s, in the mid-70s, when I was born in 1970, so I was probably five or six years old, and I was at my grand 
grandparents' home, and I remember seeing my grandmother, and this was very progressive, right, back in, uh, back in the 70s, and I remember seeing my grandmother sitting in a chair with her eyes closed, and, um, and I didn't know what it was, and, uh, and that was my first memory of meditation, was, was, seeing my, uh, was seeing my grandmother sit in a chair with her you know, straight, back, right, back straight and eyes closed and hands on her knees, and so, um, so it's interesting that, uh, that sort of the origin of where you and I met goes back to the story right. that uh, that I'm telling right now. Well, and I w- I grew up in a Christian home, and and uh, we pray. We we seldom actually just sit there in silence. Actually, though, I think that's one of the finest forms now of prayer. And after getting burned, I was exposed to meditation by a guy named Dr. Halford, and and uh, kind of an Eastern type uh, physician. And he he really taught and trained and encouraged his patients to believe in the power of meditation. And here I am as a little nine-year-old boy, 10-year-old boy, getting great benefits from slowing down and counting my breaths and experiencing life by by uh, focusing on the stuff that you can actually control and, and uh, letting your thoughts go. And you, you are an expert at this. You may not like that term, but I experienced your life, so I know it to be true. When did you realize that you were called into conscious capitalism and, and teaching others how to slow down and meditate and, and focus? Well, I'm not. I'm not going to suggest that I had any uh, sense of that early on. I, I can give you these memories, but I, uh, I definitely grew up in a, a little bit more of a traditional uh, trajectory through uh, through my uh, adolescence and high school, and then you know coming to uh, to college down in Dallas. Uh, I would say that by the time I graduated college, and I was in my uh, early twenties, I had, and I think so many people can relate with this. I, I was I was faced with the um, with the responsibility to start to make sense of my own spiritual journey, um, rather than it being defined for me by my grandparents or my parents. To really ask myself, what's the what's the journey that I want? And sometimes, um, you know, we can we like the uh, the idea of the hero's journey, which is a mm-hmm. uh, a theme that you know tends to uh, inform a lot of our curriculum design in our leadership academy. And one of the things that I like to think about is that we are all, all of us, everyone listening, we are all the main characters in the story of our life. And if we're the main character in the story of our life, one of the big questions is, is who's writing the story? You know, is the story being written for us? And, uh, and that's being written for us from our upbringing and from our family and from our, um, from our early influences. Um, or, are we able to appreciate those um, those uh, those shaping experiences, but really step into uh, being the author of our own story, uh, which often comes online when when people are in their early adulthood? And so, I uh, I found myself there in my early twenties at feeling like it, it it was time for me to take responsibility for. Uh, for asking those deeper questions, and that's when I really found um, meditation in a more uh, in a more serious form, and that's when I found um, uh, my passion for personal growth, personal development. Uh, that's when I found even you know Franklin Covey, Stephen mm-hmm. Covey's early books. Um, that's when I found the. Uh, the human potential movement and so much of, uh, of the great uh, wisdom traditions that have been written down. And I started reading about, uh, about deeper inner, what we can just call inner work. And, uh, and it all began there. And I, uh, and I would say I'm, I'm not an expert. I, I definitely say I'm a more of an advanced student maybe, uh, but I am, uh, I am in the journey, the lifelong journey of trying to learn about myself, um, starting at that point. Mm. Well, let's start at that point with where all of us are. And one of the words I heard you say a moment ago was, I I realized I needed to take responsibility. And I think our listeners today recognize that. It's one of the things we're looking for in this podcast. It's live inspired. But ultimately, we can't just get it from uh, someone else. It's it's ultimately got to be a flame that we light up and that we relight day after day. And one of the techniques that you utilize is meditation. I'm going to go through some of the quotes that I wrote down from your seminar. Okay, so... uh, I'm going to share what I heard you say. Then you can correct me on how I wrote it down poorly. And then you can tell us what it actually means. Okay. Sure. So I I, I took three pages of notes. We won't go through it all right now, but this, this was a great quote. Here it is. 
leaders, and before I tell you the rest, my listeners, that's you. Okay, so when Rand says leaders, he's not just talking to the CEOs that were in the room. He's speaking to all of us who need to take responsibility to, need, in other words, lead our lives. So leaders get the organizations and the families that they deserve. I put a big star next to that one. Leaders get the organizations and the families that they deserve. Talk about that. Yeah, it's a. Um, it, it's so often people will come to me, and they'll say, "Okay, Rand, you've been you've been working in uh, the area of leadership training and development, and I have the benefit of a, a very a talented uh, faculty that are a part of our team." And they'll say, "What is what is the sort of big?" cumulative or collective insight that you uh, that you and your team have have come to realize and and it's that statement it's that it's that leaders get the organization they deserve or um, leaders get the friends they deserve or mm-hmm. leaders get the family they deserve that there is a um, that there's an opportunity to just define this uh, this this very kind of abstract term of leadership and say you know what is leadership and and we believe that leadership is um, is um, is really um, oriented around uh, a sense of um, identity. Am I willing to take responsibility? And I'll I'll give you just a, a, a few really simple examples here. So I often find myself talking to uh, senior leaders and entrepreneurs and business owners, and I'll say, so tell me, uh, tell me what you're struggling with right now. And they'll say, oh, wow, I'm really struggling with, uh, with the fact that my, my organization is not working collaboratively. People are operating in silos. There's not good communication, and they'll have all sorts of complaints. And I'll listen and I'll ask more questions, and then they might ultimately say, and I, I really am frustrated with my, uh, with my leadership team, the people who are reporting to me, and they'll talk about how this person on their team is not doing a good job and this other person is not doing a good job, and then I'll listen and then I'll, I'll pause, and sometimes I'll put a timeout sign, and I'll say, I have a question for you. And I'll say, who hired the people that you're complaining about right now? And there'll be silence on the other side. And they'll say, what? And I'll say, yeah, who hired them? And, and they'll, they'll say, well, I did. And then I'll say, okay, and who's responsible for creating the conditions for these people to be set up to succeed in their roles? And then they'll say, well, I am. And then I'll say, so um, what a gift it is to realize that the very things that you're pointing your fingers at and the very things you're complaining about actually lead back to you. And so, and this isn't, um, this isn't about, uh, being disrespectful to them. This is about helping them to realize the power of, um, transforming themselves because, um, we have learned in our work that organizations don't change. People do. This is a really important uh, insight that took us years to come to, that organizations simply don't change. And, and when leaders hire consultants to come in and do, quote, organizational change, that is often um, not effective. And what we've learned is if we want to transform a business, then uh, work to help the leaders transform themselves, because as go the leaders, so go the entire organization. Now let's take that same philosophy or that same insight and apply it to any area of life. Someone who's leading a family, someone who's leading a church group, someone who's leading a small team as, let's say, a functional leader, that the the team itself doesn't change. The uh, the the change happens to the individual, and so we uh, we spent almost a decade with a management consulting practice inside of our organization and we hired incredibly capable people and we went out and did quote, you know, con- consulting around change work, organizational change work. And we failed to create sustainable results in, uh, in almost every case. And, uh, and we asked ourselves, why is it that most of our consulting work was not creating the kind of results we wanted and then our clients want it, but some of them were actually, uh, were actually creating some encouraging uh, transformations, and we realized when we were working where the leader was involved in, him, in, her, in himself or herself doing their own work alongside of our consulting, we actually had the conditions for, uh, for traction and success, but when it was just pure consulting, it was very, um, it, it was very disappointing. 
So knowing that, what what do we listeners <laughs> who are aware that we must take responsibility and we have to lead forward our own lives and our own businesses, our own small groups, what, what do we do recognizing that this is not just a, a flip of a switch, but it's a, it's a journey, it's a process? Well, I think one of the first things we can do is we can be grateful for the uh, the people in our lives who um, who reflect back to us where uh, where we simply are, um, are, are are we have gaps or holes in our game. So let me uh, give you an example. So it's pretty obvious that if uh, if I were to talk to someone and say, "Hey, tell me what's going on," and they say, "You know, I've got a family member, or I've got a, a colleague, or I've got a friend," and, and and we hear this often, John, and they made me so mad, like like Susie made me so mad, or Bill made me so mad. Well, the first thing in there in the language is nobody can make us feel a certain way. We can actually uh, take responsibility for the fact that. Wow, when I'm around Bill, um, I notice that I often get defensive. Or when I'm around Bill, I notice that I get triggered or I get angry. So, Rand, so right, I, right now I know people are saying, you don't know my father-in-law. You exactly. don't know <laughs> my, third, my, my, my third daughter. You, you don't know my coworker, Amy. Like, you, you don't know these people. So for, for honestly, I, I really want all of us, and I'm talking to myself primarily, and everyone else just happens to be listening in, but Rand, I want you to help me take responsibility for those feelings, and I have a feeling in doing so, you'll help the rest of us take responsibility for them as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a, the, the, the sort of first step is you ask, like, what can we do? And this is, this is such a, uh, an important question, and we don't have to sign up for a complex leadership program, and we don't have to read a bunch of books. We don't have to wait to actually start the process of waking up to responsibility. We can simply start to notice when we are, are triggered in ourselves. Like and when I say triggered, I mean, I'm sometimes called emotionally get grabbed where I'm, where I'm, uh, I'm in a relationship and I start to see a pattern and we can all think about this and say, wow, I do see a pattern where I am uh, defensive, angry, resentful, judgmental, um, when I'm around this certain person on a repeated basis. And we can either make it about them. She made me, he made me, or we can say, ha, huh, I notice in myself that this is happening inside of me. And then instead of actually trying to push it away, and this is really, uh, this is sometimes what we call uh, the power of unconditional responsibility, is to say, I am going to take unconditional responsibility. I'm, um, I'm feeling this emotional trigger around this person, could be a family member, and actually pause and be grateful and say, if it weren't for that person, then I wouldn't actually be aware that I have this, uh, that I have this sort of area that's un, that's underdeveloped in me. If I was, if I was, if I was resourced enough to deal with this particular dynamic with this person, I wouldn't get grabbed. I wouldn't get upset or defensive or angry, but because I'm getting angry or defensive in this particular moment, what a gift it is to have that person as a teacher in my life, to have that person there to shine a light on that part of me that simply isn't yet developed and isn't yet resourced to be able to be in that particular situation and that particular exchange without getting grabbed, without getting angry. Mm. And so this is this is this is a um, this is the the road less traveled for leaders is to recognize the uh, the gifts all around us. As opposed to trying to uh, trying to point fingers and say he did this and she did this and and uh, and, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna make it about other people as opposed to saying I'm just gonna make it about myself. Rand, I, I love the direction this is all going, and and I also recognize that some of our listeners are probably probably thinking, man, this is like Pollyanna. Like you can't you can't tell me that my th- three year old doesn't drive everyone crazy. So I'm, I'm going to share another quote that I wrote down that I think will empower them to recognize the gift of responsibility and awareness. So here's the second quote. With awareness, there is choice. Without awareness, there are only habits. 
So th- yeah. th- this might be worth yeah. writing down to our listeners. I'm going to say one more time, and then I'll ask Rand to reply on what, what, what is he saying here. So here it is. With awareness, there is choice. Without awareness, there are only habits. Yeah, you know, thanks for writing that one down. That's a uh, that, that's another uh, another way of getting at the idea of responsibility. I can only take responsibility for that which I'm aware, and uh, otherwise, it's happening to me. And so, if life is happening to me, and I uh, and I don't have that awareness, I'm not going to be able to step into responsibility. And so. For everybody who's listening, uh, I want to I want to really unpack this this concept. And and what John is saying is that when we have awareness, we can then choose. We can choose to um, we can choose to respond in a variety of different ways. And it could be like, oh, I've, I'm aware. And so now that I'm aware. I can choose to let, let's take uh, John because I want to make this really practical mm-hmm. and not just um, theoretical. Let's say that um, that my uh, that my three year old, or let's say that let's take let's take a little bit uh, a little bit beyond that. I've got a thirteen. I've got two daughters, thirteen and eleven. Let's say that my thirteen year old um, does something, and 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 in doing that, uh, I find myself getting upset. I find myself grabbed emotionally. If I'm um, if I'm unaware of that um, happening in me, my habit, my reactivity could be to uh, could be to yell at her or scream at her, and that means that I'm just habitually reacting, and that is unfortunately the drama that plays out for so many of us uh, in in our families and in our work life, versus the ability to notice. And there's just that small moment to be able to notice, wow, my daughter said something and, uh, and she, and she may have said something that was, um, inappropriate or disrespectful or, or, um, or crossed a boundary. And I can just pause enough in, in awareness to notice, wow, I'm really angry by this. I'm, I'm, I got, I got triggered and then I can take a deep breath and I can, with that awareness, I can choose how to respond. It doesn't mean that I choose to stay silent. The the conscious and deliberate choice might be to come back in a very assertive and a very firm way with a um, with a uh, with a boundary or with a consequence. Uh, but that's me being at choice versus me just reacting habitually and then regretting it that I got pulled into the drama after the fact. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that. If that's if that's making sense, what I'm or trying if to... anyone who's ever done life with anyone besides themselves, they're nodding their heads to this because uh, we are all, if you're honest about it, easily triggered, and it is so easy to point fingers at the three year old, thirteen year old, eleven year old, sixty four year old in law, whomever it may be, the guy who cut you off on the highway, very easy to be triggered, and uh, you are freeing us of that liberation. One, one of my the guy, as an author who I maybe look up to more than anyone else, Victor Frankel, I remember wrote something like, everything can be taken from you, but one thing, the last of the great human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And, and this is a guy who is enduring the Holocaust and reminding the rest of us who have never faced anything like that, that we have an ability to choose our path forward. Don't give it over to a three-year-old or 13-year-old or guy who cut you off on the highway. That's right. That's right. And and the quote that I uh, that you just reminded me of that uh, that many people may be familiar with is between stimulus and response there's a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. So that space is the awareness. And then with awareness comes choice. And then he ends in saying in our response lies our growth and our freedom. And what's so, what I love so much, and I know we share this love for Viktor Frankl's um, thought leadership, is that it's really about this idea that with the awareness comes choice, and with the awareness and choice comes responsibility. And then what he adds, which is just beautiful, is he gets into this idea that there's freedom in that. Because when we actually are responsible for writing the story of our life, to go back to the opening frame here, we, it's, a very, it's, it's incredibly freeing because we're not, um, we're not then being almost pushed around by life like a, like a puppet. 
we are the author of the story of our life. One of the, one of the things you layered onto that while we were together was this idea of uh, not only are you the author of your life, which is a gift, and we, uh, this is not uh, for the spiritualists in the room. I'm not saying that you are bigger and better than God, but you do get to choose how you respond in any set of circumstances. So let, let, let's do author that re, that response, that next step, and to recognize that it has an effect on those around us. You, you talked about mere neurons. To talk about what that is, why it matters, and how you know it's real. Well, I mean, there's a, there's many, many people are familiar with the idea of emotional intelligence, and emotional intelligence has gained quite a bit of popularity in the last 20 or 30 years, especially in the United States, with the, uh, with the research that has been done around, uh, around the uh, the, the role of emotions in leadership effectiveness. And yes, it's, it's wonderful that, uh, that leaders are able to draw upon their, their, their intellectual horsepower, and, and we want that to be able to solve problems, but leaders who are the most effective can bring the versatility of their, of their intellect with their emotional awareness and their emotional intelligence. And everything we've been talking about as it relates to awareness and choice is in the emotional intelligence domain. It's called self-awareness and self-management, which is the intra- personal dimension of emotional intelligence. And then there's the interpersonal dimension, which is social awareness, like you and you and someone else. And then being able to manage that social awareness is the, is the other dimension of EQ. And so what has come online uh, in, uh, in the work of Daniel Goleman in particular, who's a, uh, a popularizer as an author of emotional intelligence, he put forth in a Harvard Business Review article years ago, which I loved, he put forth this idea uh, about something called he called he calls the mood contagion, and what he said is that the mood of a leader is contagious, and it spreads through uh, it it spreads through relationships just like a contagion spreads through the body, and the responsibility that we all have um, in positions of leadership, said another way, positions of authority or responsibility, or even in positional powers where, um, where you are, um, you are, there truly is a hierarchy. And I would say that you talk about three-year-olds or 13-year-olds, parents have a, uh, have a leadership responsibility to children. And so they are the leaders and just like bosses to uh, his or her employees. And what Daniel Goldman's work found is that while while moods tend to move from one person to another, uh, what his research found is that the mood of the leader has a disproportionate impact on others. And so the CEO's mood um, has, a, has a disproportionate impact on the executive team, or the mother or the father's mood actually disproportionately influences the family system. And then what came online in the last decade or so from a standpoint of awareness um, through, through media is something called the, um, is, is the imaging of the brains. And what they found is that um, it isn't just a uh, it isn't just a theory that these that these moods move from one person to the other. We now know about the um, the concept of mirror neurons, where when you are with other human beings, those um, are, are the way that we're uh, that we're that that we have de- our human body is and our physiology is developed, and it was out of um, and it was out of need. If you know, I think the example I gave at the uh, at the speech you were at was. Um, there were there were times when our safety was determined by our ability to be in tribes, and so if a if an animal comes out and is threatening to me, um, and you are you know you and you know the rest of my tribe are behind a bunch of trees, and you're uh, and you can't see the the uh, the threat of the animal, that I will feel the fear, appropriate fear that there is a life or, or uh, a life threatening situation. And then my, um, my brain chemistry will actually, uh, will actually be picked up on by the people who are close proximity to me. And they'll feel that so that we can safely all flee in that case away. And so it's a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a biological reality that moods are contagious. Now, of course, we're those that are listening. And, and let me just, very, I'm, I'm yeah. going to stop you just for a moment because that's shocking. 
I mean, the, the idea that I can be terrified walking into a house or angry walking into a home and without saying a word, my little ones are going to pick up on it. Or I can come off a flight and be just exhausted and wiped out and full of so much anxiety and stress. And my, now my colleagues are going to feel this. Or that I'm going to walk into an audience and be fired up for life and th- they may feel that without even speaking. To me, I, I think that's remarkable and uh, inspiring and also terrifying. Like you, the way yeah. you walk into a room will influence the room itself. The way you walk into a room will influence the room itself, and the uh, even the micro behaviors that people are picking up unconsciously um, in a mother or father or leader uh, at work will actually be picked up and interpreted at a very subtle level. And so the 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 idea here is that we're we're leaking. Okay, and this is this is one of the big uh, the big practical uh, sort of pass forward on this. We're always leaking as leaders. And the question is, what are we leaking? Are we leaking in positive ways energetically, or are we leaking in uh, dysfunctional ways, in ways that are undermining our own uh, our own potential and the potential of those around us? And so this goes back to the idea just to continue to stay with this spine of responsibility that as a leader, I not only need to take responsibility for my own feelings and my own emotions um, and, and, and realizing like, wow, there's all these things happening, um, but they're not happening to me. Okay. Uh, I have the choice to respond. I can't control what's going on on the outside of me, but I can control how I respond to what's going on, how I relate to what's going on. But also now it gets, now it gets into the really, uh, the really challenging part that what's going on inside of me We sometimes say in in the conscious capitalism community um, that conscious leadership is an inside job, Mm -hmm. right? Conscious leadership is an inside job. So if I start to recognize what's going on inside of me, then I realize there's a whole other level of responsibility because what's going on inside of me is actually influencing what's going on inside of the people around me. So knowing this, as we get ready to put a bow on it, knowing this and knowing that we live and play and work in the marketplace that we all live and play and work in, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of yelling. There's an awful lot of fear. There seems to be an awful lot of anxiety. There seems to be a a longing for more hope and optimism and courage and humility. Knowing that this is all, all the headwinds that we face, what do you specifically do, Rand, to kind of slow down and own what you can and influence those around you as positively as you can? I am working on a, as I said at the beginning of the call, I am working on uh, the the never-ending uh, opportunity to just keep noticing, just keep noticing, just keep noticing. When I get, uh, when I find myself complaining, it doesn't have to be out loud to somebody. I could be uh, in traffic and I could be complaining about the person driving in front of me and then I can notice, wow, I just complained. That's feedback for me that I'm, I'm still a work in progress. And so every time I complain, whether it's in my head or to somebody else, that's a, that's a chance for me to appreciate. And sometimes it's immediately and sometimes it's not for an hour that I reflect back on it and to say, um, I still have so much work and so much development to do because I'm always getting that feedback. So I, I think it's just noticing the feedback loop of, uh, of our experience of our life would be the practice that I'm doing to the best of my ability on a daily basis. And what's one thing as we move from our interview session into what we call the Live Inspired 7, but in, in closing this piece, what's one thing you would encourage the rest of us who are busy leading at organizations or serving in healthcare or in the front of the classroom or at a desk inside the classroom to notice, you know, like I, it's hard to even become the noticer when you, when you've never done it before. So what, what, what is the first step to breathe, to inhale, to exhale and to notice, and then take the next step forward? So to make, I want to give something really concrete. So we talked, we both talked about our passion for Viktor Frankl and, and, and what he popularizes this idea of that between stimulus and response is this space. And so I would, um, I would offer everyone who's listening the uh, the invitation and maybe even the challenge to look for ways to create just a little space 
be, be, between the stimulus and the response. And a very practical way to do this is to practice with um, phone calls. And so if um, if we're so we're all going to be receiving, uh, let's say, what's our iPhone or whatever our phone is, and the phone rings. And the habit that most people have is they, uh, they look at who's calling, they call our ID, and then they say hello. And there is almost a habitual reactivity to do that quickly. And so what we teach our clients is that instead of answering it as soon as you can, to look at it, to take one deep breath in and then one deep breath out, just a single breath, letting the phone ring for just one more ring and then answering it. And that example of if you're looking for something like what can people do to practice the muscle of creating a little bit of a pause is to actually just a little bit of a pause when the phone rings. And if you're going to make a call out, you've got a 10 o'clock call in the morning, is right before you make that call, is just before you hit the habitually jump into dialing, is just to take a breath, get centered. We call it to recalibrate. And then just take one inhale and one exhale and just relax and then make the call. And if you're working in a hospital and right before you walk into the patient's room, if someone is listening as a nurse or a doctor, is just to be able to bring the presence to oneself before you walk into that room is to recognize that how you're, how you're showing up inside your, um, your, your interior, that that's going to leak out. That's going to have an impact. It's going to have a positive or a negative impact. And you actually can be much more deliberate and much more intentional about how you're going to be experienced when you walk into the threshold of that patient room or into that children's bedroom or into that employee's office. And just a single breath, and we, we, we would have a, a, a practice that in recalibration and we say stop, take a breath, ground, just visualize grounding center. And so we call it stop, ground, center. And you can that can be done in less than two seconds. One of the final notes that I wrote down before you exited stage left was this is science. This is not fluff. And I want to yeah. make sure I, I read that aloud, not only to myself as I hear a, a topic like this, and then I get back into my real life, but like this is your real life. And this is this is the best in some regards of your real life, and it is worth growing in and expanding in. So, Rand, where, where can we learn more about the work that you're doing? Well, our website at stagen.com, S-T-A-G-E-N, and we have all sorts of resources that we point to. Uh, that would be uh, that would be the easiest way to get uh, uh, our point of view on uh, on on the topic of leadership, which is obviously a big topic that uh, that we're just playing a small part in. So we have seven questions that we guide every guest through, and I want to walk us through these quickly. So exhale, inhale. Here we go. What is the best book you've ever read? Scott Peck, The Road Less Traveled. Uh-huh. Life is hard. I know the first line. I can't remember the rest of the book, but I know life the first line. Life, life is difficult. Life is life is difficult. <laughs> right. Period. Character turn. Yes. All right. What is one positive characteristic, one trait that you possessed as a child, which you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? Curiosity. Mm. If your house caught fire and your family and your animals and your bride are all out and you have an opportunity to run in and grab one item, what's the one thing you would return back outside with? Ooh, a, uh, a, a, a photo album that, uh, that has uh, family photos that don't exist digitally. Wow. If you could sit on a bench rand overlooking a beach and have a long conversation with anyone, living or dead, who would you want to be seated on that bench next to? Mm, I would say that's a good question. Um, I, I, I might right now want to have a conversation with Pope Francis. I'm Catholic. Uh, I was raised Christian, and I uh, and as a as a student of leadership, uh, I, I'd I'd want to talk to him and try to understand uh, how he's managing such a, a complex and um, such an important time in uh, in the in the history of his institution. And I I just think that would be a an, a fascinating uh, way to learn about leadership. 
you're asking a very broad question, but what do you think his answer back to you might be? So if Pope Francis, <laughs> you're managing all this stuff. It's coming at you from a million directions. You're unpopular with these folks because of this and these people because of that. How do you lead forward, and, and how do you think he responds back to you? Wow, I, you're, I wasn't expecting you to ask a follow-up question there. I, um, I well, the first thing is I don't know. I, uh, I, I think that his answer would be a combination of, uh, of, of. I talked about intellect. I think there's. I think he's a very bright. Um, systemic thinker, and I think there would be part of this would just be strategic, and I think part of his answer would likely be informed um, in, informed in a spiritual way, because he seems to be operating uh, with a very big time horizon, uh, and I think that leaders often operate with a time horizon of this quarter or this year, and I feel like he's making decisions to the best of his ability. Uh, that are in the context of a uh, a multi generational process, and uh, and I, I just I just I'm I'm in awe of uh, of how he's uh, of how he's showing up and the courage that he's that he's exhibiting. I just don't know, John. It's a that's a big that that's why I'd want to sit with him and uh, and listen because it's it's in many ways it's really beyond me the complexity right. of what he's facing right now. Well, yeah. I'll be on the other side of the bench. And so, uh, yeah, maybe you'll be you to and this. I there together. What, what is the best advice that you've ever received? Hmm. I, I'm, and I, and I'm not saying this just because, um, just because you, you know, appreciate it. Life is difficult as the first line of, uh, of my favorite book. I, I, the best advice I've received is, is from Scott Peck, the, 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 the author of that book, that, Life is difficult, and um, and life is a journey, and the journey is about engaging life uh, and learning how to relate with life. I really do feel like that line, uh, which which comes from that book, is has so for me it just has so much it has so much wisdom in it because so often we look for life being easy and we ask ourselves why why is my why do i have so much difficulties in my life instead of recognizing that life is just happening and it's not it's not what's happening it's how we relate to what's happening and so this whole idea of can we be in this dance of 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 shaping and being shaped by our life mm-hmm. and um and that's that's that that advice I consider to be exceptional. And that's cool. Can we be in this dance of shaping and being shaped by life? Very very powerful. What would you tell your twenty year old self? I would tell my twenty year old self to learn to be more present in the moment and not be so worried about the future and not be so uh, critical of uh, past, um, of past uh, situations. I think, I think for so many of us, and I know for me, uh, I've, spent, I've, spent, I've, spent, I've spent my whole life beating myself up for things that have happened in the past and regretting um, or being worried about what's going to happen in the future as opposed to the, uh, the, the, the real opportunity is just simply, and this goes back to Mindfulness 101, and it sounds almost like a cliche, but to really recognize that all we have is right here and right now, and, uh, and, and just to keep realizing that all we have is, is right here, right now. And, uh, and that's what I would tell my 20-year-old self is learn to be more present. And I'm not sure that my 20-year-old self would have listened to that uh, when, I was, uh, when I was that age. Junior so, like, SMU partying, man. I, I'm not sure you'd hear it, but uh, I hope yes, our listeners exactly. hear it. All we have is right here, right now, and it's enough. So, uh, Rand Sagan, this has been a pleasure. It has been said as we move into question number seven that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like your one sentence to read? I, I I don't know if I can I can answer. Is it is it appropriate to say I have to I have to I have to just uh, that's such a big question. That's such a beautiful big question. I uh, my one sentence. Um, he cared. Hmm. I just I just I want my life. I want my life to to 
have been a um, an expression of my care, and um, and I uh, there's a there's a beautiful uh, there's a beautiful concept that I was that I was asked once uh, and as a question from my one of my mentors, and he said, you know, tell me what you care about, and I will tell you how big you are, and that's been with me for 15 years, tell me what you care about and I'll tell you how big you are. And I, uh, I would want to be known as somebody who cared and who played really big because of that. Mm. Well, Ryan Sagan, you are a big man. You're a great leader. I love the fact that you are a student and a teacher and a learner and a father and a husband and a servant with a big heart who cares mightily. Life is a dance between being shaped and shaping life. Make something beautiful, my friends. This has been uh, this has been an hour with Rand Stegen. I am John O'Leary, and this is your day. Live inspired. Okay, guys, I know what you're thinking. John, we get it, man, we get it. Rate and review the podcast. But my friends, listen, it really does help other people find our show, which allows us to grow our Live Inspired community. Don't you want to help other people feel fired up about their lives just the way that you feel fired up about yours? So please go right now to Apple Podcast or anywhere that you listen to your show and give us a five-star rating and then go ahead and share what you enjoy most about the Live Inspired podcast together. We can make a difference.